Hi guys, I'm back. All right, it's been a while. So busy this first week, man. This call is just way too intense. I'm driving you guys crazy and you guys are driving me crazy. A lot of works. Um, so, all right, so uh, today we are going to talk about, talk about the, uh, the, the, the blood. So this is chapter four. <clears throat> All right, so this is the one here, the blood. In this week, uh, we uh, will talk, talk about uh, four, three, three different topics. The first one is blood, uh, chapter four, then we are going to talk about the metabolism, then we are going to move on to something more tangible, sales. Uh, so, it's, okay, the blood is actually extended from our previous lecture about the sales. We talked about the cell, and uh, now we are going to talk about some differentiated cell. Just very quickly, uh, do you guys remember um, what is differentiated cell means? Like fully differentiated cell? Those are the cells in which phase? G0, okay? So they, these are in the G0. So they are not going to be divided further. They are the one that they find their destination, their calling. I'm the red blood cell. I'm gonna be the red blood cell all my life. So it's not gonna divide it further. They're gonna just stay at B cells. I'm monocyte. They're gonna stay as what they are. They are go not going to be divided. They are fully differentiated cell. Okay, so we will talk about what's in the blood. What is white blood cell, red blood cells? What is hemostasis? This is the process of blood clot forming, formation. Then in the end, we will talk about the blood type. This lecture will lay you foundation for your lab. In this week, the first lab is microscopy that you don't need to turn it in. The second lab is about blood, and this lecture gives you the foundation. So I want you to review this lecture before doing that lab. So what is in the lab? Oops, what is in the blood? The blood is, you probably know it, it's blood. You know, no one has not never bleed before, bleeding before, so this is the blood. And if we, at the blood, if we put it in the centrifuge, you know, in, the, in this uh, uh, capillary tube, very thin tube, contain blood in there, uh, then we spin it, we will separate light versus heavy components. Then we will see that uh, there will be a portion, here we have two group of like simple, we will see that uh, a portion of it is fluid. This fluid is called plasma. And then another portion are uh, cells. This, the majority of these cells are red blood cells. So you can see the fluid, this is clear. There contain some proteins in it, plasma proteins. And here we have the red blood cells. The percentage of this portion of red blood cells is also called hematocrit, HCT, hematocrit. And uh, this one uh, is a way to see that how healthy the person it is. Um, so this is usually about uh, 40 some percentage here is maybe 40, not 45 yet, but maybe 44. Here we have a person who has maybe 48 percentage. So that's normal. We have more fluid, about half, and a little bit less than half, uh, hematocrit. So plasma, and uh, this portion contains uh, uh, red blood cells, but not just red blood cells. We also have some white blood cells. The amount is very little, and uh, uh, platelets. 
So all together, these cells all together is also called, called formed element. Uh, so plasma is the fluid, 55% formed element is the, is the, is the cell, blood cells. And uh, hematocrit is the fraction of the red blood cells right here. So, so we will look into what's in the plasma and what's in the cells, what's in the plasma and what's in the formed elements. So in the plasma, it's not just pure water, it contains protein. So plasma is a fluid. This one contains um, three types of proteins. Uh, one is called albumin, globulin, and uh, uh, fibrinogen. One thing you need to memorize is that the most abundant plasma protein is albumin, okay? So this is a quiz question that I have albumin, globulin, and the fibrinogen. Which one is the most abundant plasma protein? The answer is albumin. Um, the second most is the Globulin. So you may ask, what's the function of albumin? Albumin is, has, has several functions. It's an actual group of different proteins. A lot of those are uh, important to maintain the blood osmolarity. So. Then the second most, the second most abundant um, proteins are globulins. Now, globulin has three types, alpha, beta, and the gamma. Uh, the, the one you need to memorize is gamma. Gamma globulin are antibodies. So these antibodies are important uh, to maintain our body's immune system. So to help our, our body to defend body from against the, uh, the infiltrator, the virus, bacteria, etc. So these antibodies are gamma globulin. So again, this is a quiz question that which one is antibody? Antibody has so many kinds, right? Each kind of like virus, we have antibody to see it, to dissect it. So antibody is produced by B cells, uh, the lymphocyte. And the B cells is also an important immune cells that's circling around the body. When they see, when they uh, are trained to recognize one virus, they will build this antibody. And this antibody, they kind of like let this antibody out and searching, they are like drawn. They are, mm, antibody are out there, mm, searching for the intruder. And they only recognize, each antibody only recognize one intruder. So they recognize the, if the intruder has, you know, the surface has the uh, glycoprotein, glycolipid. And uh, so they have its own like a shape. Antibody is designed to match specific shape. So when they, they are like, mm, and then when they see that, does it sound like flies? More like flies, right? So when they see that, they recognize it and they will send a knock. A lot of like a please, not please, but you know, T cells, B cells, other immune cells will come over to attack that virus. And that is why we develop vaccine. So vaccine is that uh, to prevent, to prepare body of a certain disease, the vaccine is to inject that surface marker. So it's not a virus. This virus contains the toxic stuff. We don't want that. But we can just make this surface marker in the body. So we can train our B cells to recognize that surface marker. So B cell will see it, create the antibody, 
and uh, start to build a lot of antibodies mm, circling around. So the next time when we see the real virus, we already have the drone there. So before the virus have any inference to our body, the antibody will attack it and uh, kill it. So that's the vaccine. Uh, another way that antibody is important to, is to see whether this person is infected by this virus before or not. So for example, uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, we not just detect the virus load in a body, we usually detect it from the uh, upper respiratory tracts to get a sample and to see that because that's where the virus start to enter into the body. They recognize this receptor in the epithelium cells in our upper, our respiratory tracts, the upper portion is one that it, they enter into the body. And uh, so not just, we not just measure the virus load, we can also get the blood and to see if the person has the antibody. If the person does have the antibody, it means this person already built the immune capability to be against this virus. So there was an um, idea that how can we help our economy to grow while we can protect our population. The way to do it is to you know, give the person with the passport that so you already got infected and you have the antibody. So you are pretty much like, can do whatever you want. You know, you don't need to worry about the virus. But there's also idea, idea that maybe the virus has some mutation, you know, because this virus changed so fast, they may develop new mutants. And so the surface marker is already different. Then the person may be infected again. This is new virus, uh, so a lot we still don't know. Okay, so going back to this, the, the, for the quiz purpose, you need to remember is that, what you re need to re remember is uh, actually two things. One is that the antibody is gamma uh, globulin. So, and the second thing is that antibody coming from the B cells. Uh, we are not talking about here, but later slides, you will see it. So you just need to memorize, that's the B cell. And then fibrinogen is the proteins in the plasma to form the blood clots. So that's important to prevent bleeding. Uh, this fibrinogen and a lot of uh, clot factors are originally produced from the liver. And, uh, and the, this fibrinogen is the inactive form. So we don't see the blood clot just randomly in the blood, right? It would be bad if we have this clot just randomly build, they will form this thrombosis and they kind of stuck in our blood vessel and we will lose the blood flow, which is bad. So this fibrinogen is an inactive form. They are not functional. They are there to be activated. So before the activation, they are they have no function. They flow very smoothly along the blood. They will not form this clot. So that's that. So three proteins, three type of protein. What's the most important? Albumin. Uh, which one is the uh, uh, antibody? Gamma globulin. And which one is important for the blood clot? formation of the blood clot, fibrinogen, okay? Now the cells, the formed element is the, are, uh, contains the cells. So the cells, blood cells has basically three types. Red blood cells is the most abundant one, white blood cells, and then platelets, okay? So red blood cells uh, is also called erythrocytes, the most abundant one, was a function of the red blood cells. The red blood cells is the one that carry oxygen. Uh, so red blood cells, how can red blood cells carry oxygen? 
what's the protein in the red blood cells to carry oxygen, the hemoglobin, right? For the structure of hemoglobin, quaternary structure, it has four chains stick together to complete this hemoglobin. And the white blood cells, you can see that these red blood cells, these are white blood cells. So even though that we call it white blood cells separate from red, this is actually a group of five different types of cells. White blood cells are also called leukocyte. So this is also called leukocyte. And platelets. Platelets are small, very small cells. And uh, um, one thing that you need to know is that these two, platelet and the red blood cells, one thing common is that they do not have nucleus. So they are differentiated. So they were original cell, differentiate, you know, grow into the following their calling their purpose. They become a very fully differentiated cells and they do not. These two cells do not contain nucleus. These white blood cells have nucleus. So let's talk about the red these cells. So the formation, the the uh, the de development of these cells, they are all originated from the stem cell. Stem cells are the one do the division. So they divide it one to two, two to four. But when they are ready to pursue their own destination, their calling, they will be differentiated into different type of cells. So the stem cell are all located in the bone marrow. All of these blood cells, stem cells are origin originated in the bone marrow. There are two types of stem cells. One is called myeloid stem cell. It's right here, myeloid stem cell. The other one is called lymphoid stem cell. And the lymphoid stem cell only produce lymphocyte. Other white platelet and red blood cells are produced from the myeloid. So these two are separated that way. Lymphocytes contains T cell, B cells. B cell is the one to produce the antibody. So this process is called hematopoiesis. And uh, the thing you need to memorize is that uh, the stem cells of the, the original, there are several steps, but make it very simple. You need to remember the very original one, the lymphoid stem cells and the myeloid stem cell. So let's look at these red blood cells. Oh, again, the, they are produced from the red bone marrow Myelo stem cells are produced. Are uh, this uh, all these uh, stem cells are stored in the red bone marrow? It's because that in our bone marrow we have a red bone marrow and a white bone marrow, a yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow contains a lot of lipid. They are not the one to contain the uh, stem cells. So here showing you the location of this. Uh, uh, the stem cells to produce the blood cells. So in the kids, all the bones contain the red bone marrow. In adults, when the bone grow, uh, only this central portion of the bone contains red bone marrow. So let's talk about the red blood cells first. We will talk about red blood cells, white blood cells, and the platelet, and then we talk about the uh, the blood clot and the, red, uh, the blood type. So the red blood cells are originally originated from the bone marrow, myeloid stem cells, and they produce the red blood cells. And uh, what can stimulate the bone marrow to produce 
the red blood cell? The answer is because this bone, these red blood cells has function to carry oxygen. So if the oxygen level in our body is low, like the one you live in like a higher attitude, you know, the oxygen level is low, then your body will start to stimulate the red blood cells to produce more oxygen. This is the chronic process. So it's not like saying that you lose the oxygen, like ischemia, something like that, or suffocation, then you immediately will induce the production of the red blood cell. This is, in this situation, it's more that chronic, gradual change in our body. Our body is very dynamic. We can adapt into a certain different type of environment. So how does it? So the way our body responds to the low oxygen level is the one in the kidney. Okay, so this is very important in the kidney. So we talk about the uh, homeostasis, that the sensor, the integrator, the responder, right? The effector. So the one to detect the oxygen level low is in the kidney. Weird, right? But that's how it does. And then kidney respond to the low oxygen level by producing the the protein or hormone is called erythropoietin, right here, erythropoietin. And uh, this is important. This is the term you need to memorize. Which one, which protein, which hormone will stimulate red blood cell formation or production, erythropoietin. They will, low oxygen level, kidney produce, Urethral pointing and uh, to stimulate the red bone marrow to produce the uh, red blood cells. And then red blood cells increase the capacity of our body to carry oxygen. So our, our body will have higher chance to receive the oxygen needed. So two, two questions here you will see in the quiz. It's not just my quiz, but you know, it's very typical questions. The hormone called erythropoietin, where does it produce in the kidney? Which produce it? And how, how does it got produced low oxygen level? And what's the function to stimulate the production of red blood cells? So this is the long like a more like complete process of the red blood cell. You don't need to worry all this at all because it's just too tedious. tedious. Um, what you need to know is that uh, right before the red blood cells become red blood cells, the immature version of this matured red blood cells is called radiculocyte. And uh, so here is from the my myeloid stem cells. In the end, it will produce, convert, uh, differentiate to the radiculocytes. These radiculocytes will, so before the radiculocytes, everything is in the bone marrow. And then radiculocytes will go into the circulation, into the blood vessel. And then radiculocytes will form the red blood cells. So in, when, when we do the complete blood count, we should be able to identify some red blood cells, which is immature, not fully matured yet. And that in the typical condition, it will take about 2% of the red blood cells. These are the radiculocytes. Now let's look into the, these matured red blood cells, urethrocytes. So this is very common if you have a, a drop of blood under the microscope, this is what you expect to see, a lot of red blood cells. One thing that you can recognize them are red blood cells that they don't have nucleus, okay? They are, in a way, when we see it under microscope, they basically is 
hollow center is because that there is no nucleus. They have this biconvey disc shaped cell. So it's right here. And that, that increase their surface to release oxygen. They don't have nucleus. Each cell, when they are produced, the first day is ridiculousite. It's not fully mature, but after that, you will have about a total uh, 120 days, about four months, right? Life before they die. So that's their journey. <clears throat> they become red blood cells carrying the only job they do is to carry oxygen. And they do that for four months, then they die. So that's 125 four months is also an important thing that you need to memorize. Quick question. <clears throat> Their job is to carry oxygen. And how does they do it? They have protein, they have abundant protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four chains. Each chain contains a chemical structure called heme. This heme contains iron. So each heme can carry one O2, one oxygen. So the full capacity of the hemoglobin is to carry four oxygen. When they carry oxygen, this hemoglobin is called oxygen hemoglobin. If they don't have the oxygen, it's called the oxyhemoglobin. They will also appear different color. So we can use the infrared to see how much this hemoglobin are occupied by oxygen. If it's fully occupied, it will be very red. We can detect that through that light, shine through it, and uh, it will be very red. So we know that, okay, 99% are, are occupied by oxygen. Or it could be low, you know, if the person has a disease, something like that, the, or has the suffocation uh, from the oxygen, then the color will become darker because the occupation of this space uh, are, is not fully occupied by the oxygen. Where is that? Where is that? Okay. Yeah. That. yeah. Okay. So we can detect that level. This is called the saturation percentage. Each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen. If it's fully carry, if it's fully occupied by oxygen, uh, we got it like 99%, 100% saturation. If it's not, we can get probably 80, 70. Usually we get, when we do it, when we use this pulse oximeter in the finger, we have some mixture of the uh, arterial blood and the vein blood. So uh, the percentage is not like 100, but still pretty high, 99, 98. So that's normal situation. So in a way that these red blood cells do its job up to its full capacity that they usually only, they, they, they typically carry about 100% of the oxygen. So this saturation percentage uh, would change uh, in the lung compared to in the tissue. So in the lung, when we first breathe in, we will provide our red blood cells with air from the outside air. Um, and that kind of oxygen level. So what's the 
oxygen in the air. How much? 20%, right? 20% oxygen. And uh, here we see this curve. This curve de describes that uh, oxygen saturation ratio. So this curve is called oxygen dissociation curve. Describe, this curve describes the oxygen occupation or saturation per percentage versus versus what versus the oxygen pressure so what's this oxygen pressure in the air the 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 air has the pressure do you guys remember air pressure the air pressure the air pressure is um, about 760 right mmhg so that's the air pressure. And uh, how much of this is the oxygen? About 20%, right? So 20% times 760. This will give you the amount of about 150 mmHg. So this is the amount of oxygen in the outside air. When we breathe in, our body well, that percentage will reduce a little bit to about 100. So here we have the 100 mmHg oxygen O2 reach to the alveoli, the region that we will get oxygen into the blood. With that percentage, that kind of push of the air, oxygen, that kind of air in the outside we have about the pressure is 150 reach too long it reduces a little bit because we have the force to push it you know against it our body has this uh, environment to against it one is because the humidity we have is just very humid in our body you know against it a little bit but even so the oxygen pressure provide about 100 mmHg. So with that pressure, oxygen got occupied all these red blood cells. And so we have about, with that, we have about 100% uh, saturation rate. All these red blood cells, each red blood cells is very much like taxi or Uber, each one can carry four customer, okay? So in the lung, it's everybody jumping. When they see any empty space, they jump in. So it's fully occupied by oxygen. That's in the lung. Now the blood will carry that. All the taxi driver will go into that lung and carry that oxygen, everybody is fully packed, then they leave, right? They leave to around the body. When they go to the body though, say so go into the body, what they will see is that they are going from the highly reached oxygen area from the air, 100 mmHg, to the region that is so dry because all the cells require oxygen. And uh, they use oxygen for oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria to produce ADP. So they go to the region that all oxygen is consumed. This region that's when they see outside is so empty, so rare oxygen out there. So when they go there, the oxygen cannot stay in the taxi anymore because cells need oxygen. Cells see the oxygen like you see the money. If you see there's a cash on the floor, what would you do? You pick it up, right? You get it and they put it in your pocket. That's how cells see the oxygen. They need oxygen. So the red blood cells carry the hemoglobin, go through the local tissue, all tissue, any tissue, as long as they see the tissue. So in the artery, it's, it's kind of like still in the vessel, but when they 
going to the capillary is kind of very, very, you know, uh, open to the inter, there's a inter, inter, interaction, interchange, interchangeable environment in the, with the tissue. So the tissue see the oxygen, they will, they, and oxygen cannot stay in that cab, that uh, taxi or Uber anymore. They can, they will be getting away from the uh, hemoglobin. So in a local tissue, the oxygen pressure is very low, say here, about 40. That is because that, that is the area, it's like a desert, right? There's no oxygen there. So it's like desert, there's no water there. So the water in the, what you carry will be, will diffuse, will move from one location to, to the desert. So tissue with that low oxygen pressure, low oxygen environment, they cannot hold the oxygen anymore. Their saturation rate, their capability to hold down that oxygen is reduced. It will be reduced from 100 to 80%. If the person doing exercise, like you use your muscle, burning all the uh, fuel from your muscle, you, you will need oxygen furthermore. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the environment will use more oxygen and the red blood cells can carry uh, the uh, hemoglobin even less. All what they carry from the lung will be delivered into the environment. So this is the oxygen dissociation curve. This one describes the relationship of oxygen saturation ratio percentage versus the environment oxygen pressure. So hemoglobin is very important. Hemoglobin level is very important. Uh, in the lab, uh, we will also have the experiment to see a person's hemoglobin level. So the typical hemoglobin level is about 15 gram per decimal liter. Right here. A healthy individual has about 15 gram per of hemoglobin per decimal liter of the blood. And, uh, and uh, that color can be vary. So we, we, we use this uh, TelQuest test. We have the test paper, uh, put a drop of blood on it, and the color will change. And we will match it with this table and to see which one match the best. And then we can see that if this blood has uh, hemoglobin level to be healthy, 15, or to be too low. If the hemoglobin level is too low, it can indicate the person may have anemia, that the capacity to carry oxygen in the blood is lower. All right, so that's the red blood cells life, 120 days, okay? And then there will be one day they will die. And when they die, how will they do? So that's what we are going to say right now. We are going to talk about aged red blood cell degradation. How will they do when they die? So they will be eaten by macrophage. Macrophage is the uh, immune cells, uh, monocytes is one of them there are some monocytes reside in the local tissue. One region contains a lot of those is spleen. So spleen is a region that contains this macrophage. The macrophage can eat damaged cells, including aged red blood cells. So when they will eat it, when they eat it, they engulf it, and then they will break it apart. And uh, we already know what's in the cell, basically carbohydrates, 
proteins and the lipid, right? And so the cell membrane lipid, the uh, proteins will be used, proteins will be degraded to form this amino acid, and all these can be used in the cells. One thing that cells will recycle is the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin contains iron, iron, iron be, will be needed in our body to build new red blood cells. Um, so hemoglobin has this protein, protein will be carried to form the amino acid. There's four chains inside it, it has this chemical called heme. So heme is not lipid, not protein, not carbohydrate. So this one will need to be processed further. So then we will, after the macrophage eaten it, we have two things spit out. One is the iron. Our iron will be released. Then iron will be carried back to our bone marrow by ferrin, ferritin, sorry, ferritin and the transferrin. So these are the proteins to carry iron. And then they send back to the bone marrow. Bone marrow will use it to build new, pro new red blood cells. And then him, him is this chemicals. Him is not something that the cell can use right away. So him will be released. Him will first to form the bilirubin. And the bilirubin then will be uh, processed by liver to form part of it, to form the bile. So, so this one is a figure showing you that this journey of degradation of red blood cells, cell RB, RBC recycle. So first, bone marrow produce red blood cells and uh, if it's dying, 120 days, it enter into the spleen here is the macrophage, eaten it. Macrophage will take all what they can take and uh, hemoglobin will be processed to form the bilirubin. And uh, then it will circulate in the blood. This bilirubin, if it's too much in the blood, it will become jaundice. Uh, bilirubin will be further processed in the liver. So, and in the liver, it will produce one of the, become a part of the bile, and the bile will be secreted into the large intestine, and, uh, and will be used to, uh, to form the, to be excreted out. Uh, so that, It's about that. Part of the bilirubin can also be, you know, uh, part of the urine to be get pee out, but the majority is becoming the bile from the uh, liver. Also here, heme, right? Heme contains iron. Iron will be transported through the transferrin back to the bone marrow. So the key, the, the, the quiz question are basically those bolded here. Bilirubin, heme to form bilirubin in liver. It doesn't say here, but you need to, bilirubin is, bilirubin, let me write down here. Bilirubin is processed by liver. To form, to form the bile, and uh, the one to transport iron is ferrin, ferritin, and the transferrin. Transferrin is the major one. Ferritin is one that stay in the cell. The iron by itself is not that stable. We need to kind of like uh, package it 
to prevent its inter interaction with our cell organelles. So in the inside of cell, we have the ferritin to carry it. In the blood, it will become transferrin to carry it. And uh, macrophage are the major organ is in the spleen. So that's that. <clears throat> okay, so this one just <clears throat> transferrin is one to carry red blood cells in the blood. Sorry, transferrin is one to carry iron in the blood. So this one summarize it kind of repeat itself, right? We talk kind of talk about it already. Uh, so the hemoglobin, uh, the globin part, those proteins are degraded into amino acids in the macrophage. The heme, this chemical, will be further processed. Iron will be redu reduced him will be broken uh, apart into uh, the uh, biliverdine. You don't need to memorize this part because this is not that significant, not that clinical relevant. But the bilirubin is one in the blood. And the bilirubin is then transported into the liver to be processed. And uh, oh, you don't need to remember this one here. And it will form the bile into the intestine. And so this one, again, show you the picture that uh, uh, kidney released erythropointin, erythropointin trigger the production of red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells, if 120 day later, die, spleen contains macrophage to eat it. Uh, the cells has all this good stuff are taken by the macrophage, protein, carbohydrate, lipids are all taken by the macrophage. Heme will be released. Heme contains iron, iron, so heme globulin, the protein, protein is taken away by the amino acid. Heme contains iron, iron will be transported by the transferrin uh, back to the bone marrow. Bilirubin, Bilirubin right here, bilirubin will become, go, go to the liver, get further processed to form the bile, to stick it out. And uh, iron, transferrin, will be transported back to the bone marrow. So if the body has too much of this bilirubin, then the person will appear yellowish. We already talked about the one possibility that the person may have too much bilirubin that is the liver damage. If liver is injured, it cannot process this bilirubin. So bilirubin will be accumulated in the blood and uh, it will become jaundice. Uh, there are three other causes to cause bilirubin, uh, to cause the jaundice. One is that uh, the red blood cell damage. If there's red blood cells damage, uh, it was called the uh, hemolytic uh, jaundice. Red blood cell damage is called hemolysis, just a term, that the red blood cell become degraded. One possibility is the, uh, the plasma does not have the correct uh, osmotic level, and then cell will burst, break apart. Another one is hepa hepatic jaundice. This is uh, liver damage. And the other one is biliary obstruction that they don't get to processed to become the bile. So all this situation will produce jaundice in the person. The key here is, again, the 
bolded one, Beruvin. So the major components to cause these junctions is bilirubin. All right, so that is the red blood cells. We talk about the birth, we talk about the death. Now let's go into the white blood cell. But before that, let's kind of get an idea that what's the current uh, clinical works to use to examine the blood. The way it does is called a complete blood count. So if you have the, uh, the doctor order to do the complete blood count, it's called CBC. Uh, basically, it's a machine called uh, uh, hematology analyzer. So it's now that it's job is pretty easy. You get the blood, put it into this uh, machine, check it, work on it, and it will print out the results very quickly right away. So what we will, will get from this complete blood count include the amount of all the cells, amount of red blood cells, amount of white blood cells, amount of hemoglobin, and also hemato, hematocrit. So that's the, this, uh, in addition to that, um, we can also get some measure of this value. So the key here is, we will also get some red blood cell quantification quantities here. MCV is an important term you need to memorize. It's called mean uh, corpuscular volume. This MCV is the measure of one RBC volume. So that's the size of one RBC. A typical one is about 90 FL, because liter. So very small, that's one. So MCV, you will get 90 if it's healthy. Uh, we also can get MCH, mean corpuscular hemoglobin. This is amount of the hemoglobin in the cell. So it's usually it's about uh, 30 picogram per cell. So it's also inside of the cell, how much of the hemoglobin in it. We then also have the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, MCHC. This one is the MCH right here divided by MCV. So this one becomes the density decimal liter. How many hemoglobin in decimal liter of packed RBC? And then we have the hemoglobin concentration in the blood. We talked about this one already, this right here. Right, hemoglobin concentration in the blood. It's about 15 gram per decimal liter. So this one will refer back to, if we don't have this uh, hemato hematology analyzer to do the work for us, in a, we can also use a test paper. That's right here, PayQuest test paper to test the hemoglobin level. So it's around 15 gram per decimal liter. If we have the machine, it does it for us. We got the hemoglobin concentration in the blood. So do you need to memorize all these? What do you need to memorize? So in these two slides, what you really need to memorize is that complete blood count. 
So this term. Okay, CBC. And the other thing you need to memorize is that it's good to have the idea about this number. But if you don't memorize it, it's fine, it's okay. But you need to have the idea. You don't need to know the exact number, but you need to have the idea. Hematocrit is about half, 50%. Uh, hemoglobin number is about 15. Uh, RBC level is about five milliliter per ml, millimeter cubic. White blood cell is about 500 to 10, sorry, 5,000 to 10,000 cells per uh, millimeter cubic. You just need to have some idea. So when you see the report, usually when you see the report, they will tell you right away that if it's normal or not. But at least you need to have some idea. As for these slides, the thing you need to memorize is only this one, MCB, because we will need to know the RBC size. Size. Being corpuscular bar MCB. The other, these two important part, don't need to memorize it. Uh, all right, so the reason we need to know the, okay, so the disease of the red blood cells. Uh, if we have less red blood cells or less hemoglobin, the patient will have anemia. Uh, there are different type of anemia, uh, meaning that the person has low capacity to carry oxygen in the blood. Hemorrhage anemia, the leakage, usually this happens when there is a, say, car accident, a lot of leakage, internal hemorrhage, uh, so lose a lot of blood. Uh, hemolytic, anemia, the damaged red blood cells. Uh, so that red blood cell die, even though hemoglobin is in the cells, they leak out. When they leak out, they actually can cause other damage to the body. The reason that red blood cells carry this hemoglobin has a reason. They, they are packed in the RBC, so they will not interact with other cells. But when the red blood cells die, this hemoglobin will be released and they can cause some further damage. Uh, aplastic anemia is the bone marrow function is uh, damaged. And another one is sickle cell anemia. With this one is the hemoglobin, hemoglobin mutation. So that's less, low RBC. If we have too many RBC, then we can have a polysynthia, polysynthemia. And this one will increase the blood viscosity. The blood become highly high viscosity. So the flow will be impact. It can increase the production of thrombosis because when the blood is still, this femorrhage will may have higher chance to be activated. If it's flow, you know, they just don't see each other, they don't interact with each other that much. But if they steal, if the blood is still, then there's higher chance to form this uh, thrombosis. It can also increase the blood pressure, blood pressure, BP. So uh, here, the reason why we need to memorize the MCV is that MCV is used for to distinguish these two types of anemia. One is called the nutritional anemia. Nutritional anemia will have small RBC. So MCV will be lower than 80 
And this one is caused by the iron deficiency. Another one is the pernicious anemia. This one will lead to enlarged RBC, but these enlarged RBC are more fragile, so they will die faster. And uh, so MV, MCV will become higher. And uh, here is caused by the uh, vitamin B deficiency or folic acid deficiency. So MCV mean corpuscular volume uh, is one to quantify the size of the RBC. If it's high, is the uh, pernicious anemia. If it's low, is the nutritional anemia. The normal value should be around 90 uh, femotoliter FL. So that is the red blood cells. Next stop is the white blood cells. So white blood cells has this, four, this, uh, this group of the cells. Um, all these cells contain nucleus. Uh, these cells are all immune cells. Uh, we have the, uh, the most abundant one is a neutrophil, neutrophil, this is the most abundant one. Neutrophil, eosinophil, basophils, all these three are also called granulocyte. The monocytes and uh, neutrophil can do macrophage. So these two can conduct macrophage right here, can conduct phagocyte. Our, our professional phagocyte, they can eat bacteria, eat stuffs. And here, lymphocyte, lymphocyte basically is T cell and the B cell. B cell is the one to produce antibody. So white blood cell production coming from the myeloid stem cells and the lymphoid stem cell, lymphoid stem cell to produce lymphocyte, uh, myeloid stem cell to produce other white blood cells. These cells can remain in the blood, but the monocytes can move into the tissue. When they move into the tissue, they form the macrophage like the one in the spleen, they form the macrophage. Who can conduct this uh, phagocytosis? Monocytes is one of it, and the other one is the neutral field. Neutral fields. So let's describe each one of these white blood cells. Neutral fields, the thing you need to memorize is that a uh, couple of things. One is that that's the most abundant white blood cells. The second thing is that the morphology, it has a very unique nuclear structure. It's called segment, segmented, segment, sorry, segment nuclear. Uh, so that nuclear structure is unique. It's also called polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes. Uh, and uh, uh, the function is to engulf, so they can conduct this uh, uh, phagocytosis. They can release prostaglandin and uh, leukotrienes to induce inflammation. They also are the one to produce pus in the injured tissue. So in the lab, you probably, I don't know if this will stay in the online lab, but in the lab, we will also look into the 
cells. And here you can see the segment neutral fields versus band. So here is the segment. If the line is so thin that you probably could not even recognize it, it's called segmented neutral field. If it's still, you can see the connection of this different part of the nucleus. This is called band neutral field. The band neutral field is the immature one. So band neutral fields are intermediary steps prior to the complete maturation of the segmented neutral field. So the band one is the mature one, the segmented, fully segmented one is the matured one. So that's a neutral field. The, second, the next one is alcinophil. So the color is reddish. So you can see that here, this one is the neutral field. This will be alcinophil. You probably can see the color here too. So the neutral field is not so red. Alcinophil is very red and the basophil is blue. All this basically has like segmented uh, nucleus. And all these three are so-called granulocyte because they have a lot of granule in there. This granule basically contains uh, chemicals, hormones. So they are very, contain a lot of this uh, prostaglandin, for example. So when they are excited, they release those into the blood and that will induce inflammation. Neutrophil, eosinophil. So eosinophil uh, doesn't eat, but they can secrete these toxic components to kill. So they are granule, this granule contains these toxic components, compounds to kill the bacteria or virus. They basically what they do is that they will open pore, open pores. So the cells kind of like uh, got attacked by, not cells, but a virus got attacked by the, these uh, compounds and they will be degraded. One thing is that when they do that, it's not just causing the damage to the virus, they're causing basically damage to tissue surrounding it. Eosinophils also is a sign for the allergy, uh, allergic response, such as the, uh, and also ast asthma. We will see the increased amount of eosinophil in the blood. So this eosinophil, basophils, uh, is also a granulocyte and uh, they uh, are more like bluish color and uh, they will release when they are activated, they release histamine. Histamine can cause dilation of the blood vessel. And uh, uh, so with that, we will have a lot of fluid to be filtered out of the blood vessel. And so in the local tissue, you may see the swelling, histamine, and also in the nasal, we will produce a lot of mucus by this. That's why that antihistamine is a drug to prevent the production and uh, is a way to suppress this react this re this this action heparin also released from the basal fields heparin can prevent blood clotting so that's the basal field monocytes is one that can engulf uh, intruders 
monocytes is not granulocyte, so they don't have that granule components in the cells. Monocytes can also move to the local tissue and reside there to conduct this uh, macrocytosis. Uh, Lymphocytes, the major lymphocytes are B cell, T cells, and also nature killer cells, NK cells. Uh, B cells, when they are fully differentiated, they are called the plasma cells. They release the antibody. So that's a quick question. Which cells produce antibody? That's B cells. Uh, T cells, so B cells, T cells are immune cells. B cells send out drone, mm, this antibody. T cells is the one that is called cell cell like uh, interaction. So they are the one to, they don't send out drone, they don't send out antibodies. They are the one that will go to the door, knock the door and check if this is virus, if this is bacteria. So they are very much like police, right? Go to your car and ask you to provide your ID. So they are the one like that. And they do two things. They will check if you can provide the ID and say that I'm good, you know, I'm, I belong to this body, then you are fine, you can go. And if you show no ID, T cell will kill you. And this happens when we have the uh, implant or transplant that doesn't have the matched ID. It because we got transplant from other patients. Then this transplant carry these cells. They are not the same cells as our original cells. So they cannot present the ID. And the, the T cells will see it as a intruder or non-cell cells, then it will kill it. Uh, also, if the tumor cells uh, become mutated and they cannot present the ID, the T cells can also kill it. Uh, we have another group of cells that's directly acts on the cancer cells. It's called natural killer cells. So this one is very much like T cells. They go out there, check on the ID, and if they see abnormal cells, they will kill it. So B cells is the one to send out drone. Mm, so it, it's like a central there and, uh, and just sitting in the air conditioner room like doing, just watching the drone draw out there and uh, detect the bacterial virus. T cells is the one do the, you know, person to person interaction, go out there, knock the door, check the ID one by one, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, with that, if it's not self cells, they will kill it. So that's the lymphocytes. Now let's talk about the platelets. So platelets are also no nucleus like red blood cells. Uh, platelets is also called uh, thrombo, thrombocyte. This platelets, this one is the platelets. It doesn't have nucleus, but it has everything else. Uh, it has the mitochondria, it has, uh, so it produces ATP, ATP is needed for a lot of works in these cells. And one thing you need to know that is that uh, no nucleus, that's one thing. The second thing is that they are fragment of mega, mega karyocyte, mega karyocyte. So this is mega karyocyte. 
and a fragment from these platelets. Platelets are not just a fragment, they are cells. They are first when they are produced or when they are present, they are not activated. They are quiescent, they are there. But when they are activated, they will stick together to form this plaque to prevent the blood leakage. So now we already talked about two things can prevent blood leakage. One is platelet, right? Platelet. It will be activated and uh, so planet be activated and uh, got stick together to form the plaque. So that's one thing we mentioned here. Another thing we also mentioned earlier is fibrinogen. This is one of the three group of the plasma protein. Right here, fibrinogen. So fibrinogen also acts for the blood clot. So fibrinogen, so that is one platelet. Fibrinogen also is short. They also have a short like protein. They can be activated to form clot. Come back together. This one is called fibrin. So we can form clot or this one, blood clot through two different pathway. One is the platelet activation, sorry, platelet activation. And the other one is fibrinogen activation in the platelet. So we have two pathway to do that. So that leads to the topic about the blood clot formation. This one is called the hemostasis. So when the pa this one is triggered, it's not going to happen unless there is vessel leakage. So this one is the blood vessel. <clears throat> blood vessel, and when there's leakage, blood flowing out, which is not good because blood is important for our body. And uh, then first thing is that vessel constriction, vessel will start to shrink to prevent the flow. Otherwise it's wide open, our flow is just flowing out. So they will shrink a little bit and uh, uh, to prevent the blood leakage. Then we will have two pathway, platelet, as I mentioned before, will be activated. And the other one is fibrinogen, will be activated. So that's that. Let's look at this one here. First is in the blood, we have the red blood cells a lot and also platelet right here, here. So this one are basically inactivate. They are not triggered, they are not activated yet. When they flow and when they see something outside of the vessel, What's common one is the collagen. Collagen are in the vessel wall here, collagen here. So when they see the collagen, because when it's break, they will see the collagen. When they see the collagen, they will get activated. These platelets will become sticky together. So this platelet, this platelet. This platelet will stick together, will be activated. 
and then they will form. There's a special term for that. It's called plug. Plug. And then fibrinogen. This will fibrinogen will also be activated. This activation is more complicated. This one is go through a series of step by step. And then activate it. Clear this one here, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So when there's lesion, it will go step by step and then will activate it. Fibrinogen will become fibrin, and the fibrin will become activated one. They will stick together. So here you can see the platelet. Here's platelet, fibrin, fibrin coming from the fibrinogen. So that's two different pathway, and they work together to form the the the, the clot. Platelet is not good enough because these are cells. So cells is like a big rock. So even though they are pretty good to provide the foundation of this clot, they are not tight enough. They are whole here. They are large rocks. Fibrins are the one like a cement. So they can fill into this environment to make it further sealed. So we have both. We have, uh, you want to build, you want to, if you, your, your wall has a hole, you want to build a solid construction to prevent the hole, to block this hole. You don't just use soil, right? You don't, you just don't use cement. You will need some rocks, some bricks first, and then you put cement on it. And the dark rocks are the planet. The cements are the fibrin. fibrin. So how does it happen? One is the, uh, it's called uh, VWS, VWF, the von Willenbrand factor. This von Willenbrand factor are in the blood. So here, a lot. Here. They are the one to initiate this process. So when they are in the blood, they are not triggering anybody. But when they see the collagen in the vessel, so here is the blood vessel. Blood vessel, blood vessel, the very inner portion is called endothelium, right here. The very inner portion is endothelium. So endothelium prevent blood, this VWF to see anything in the vessel wall. And this is the vessel wall. The vessel wall contains smooth muscle and also one of it is the elastic fiber, etc. One of it is collagen. So this, when the wall is broken, is broken, then VWF will see the collagen and then it will trigger the platelet to become activated. Then platelet form the platelet plug. So that's the first, a lot of rocks accumulated, stuck together in the lesion area. This platelet will then also release uh, two important Factor one is called thromboxin A2, TXA2, thromboxin A2, and ADP, uh, adenosine diphosphate. So this one is, we know we know ATP, triphosphate. This one is ADP, diphosphate. This two is one. So when the platelet, platelet, uh, in the beginning, it's only, it's only it's not activated. 
they are not stick together. The VWF, when they see this collagen, they activate it, they will trigger it. They will make them, make them, activate them. What they will do, they will make them two things. What they will first make them to stick together. The other thing is that they will make them to release. To release, sorry, to release. Okay, make them to release. T, sorry, boxing A2, T, TX A2, and also ADP. It will make them to release these two, some boxing A2 and ADP. And then it will trigger these paralyzed cells to activate a membrane protein right here. So some boxing A2 and ATP cells will release. T X A2 and ATP. ATP, sorry, ATP. And then it will X on itself to open up to activate this membrane protein. Let's use another color if I may. Go right here. This is called the uh, globulin protein 2B and the 3A. So that's right here. That's this thing here. They will activate it. The reason that they activate it is to be able to bind. Let's use screen. Binds the fibrinogen. So fibrinogen will then bind to it binds with it. This is a free brain chain. So the planet first uh, VWF will make them stick together. And then when they stick together, it's not good enough. It's a good, quick response for the leakage. The second thing is that they need cement. But cements out there, they have no idea. So they need to grab the cement. The way that, that they grab this fibrinogen is that they release uh, TXA2 and ADP. They release it to X on themselves. They X on themselves to activate the membrane protein, glycoprotein, GP2B and 3A. This Glycoprotein on the membrane will be activated to start to grab. Whatever flows through the fibrinogen will grab them together and stick together. So that is the condition that we have in after this step. We have the rocks put together and also rocks change their surface to raise the hands, this GP2B and the 3A to grab fibrinogen. So that's this step. They grab this, like, you know, branch, something like that, grab it. The next step is to activate this fibrinogen into fibrin, because at this point, they are not connected together yet. They are monomer, they are separated. So that's figure right here. So this is the lesion uh, damaged vessel here. This one is the collagen. Collagen contains the VWF. VWF will activate platelet. When platelets are activated, they will st stuck together, this rock stuck together. They will also release some boxing A2 and ADP. When they release that, they X on themselves. They X on themselves to activate the glycoprotein 2A and 3B on the surface. And that will grab this fibrinogen with them. So they will grab that 
fibrinogen, fibrinogen. We stand. And then that's that. Uh, this fibrinogen, the next step is to activate fibrinogen to form fibrin. It's just another figure showing you that tissue damage VWF activated the platelet. Platelet has a surface uh, to activate, to release the, they change the surface to become stuck together. They release ADP and the TXA2, and that will act on themselves to form, to activate their membrane protein, uh, glycoprotein 2B and 3A, that will start to grab the fibrinogen. And the next one is activate the fibrinogen. Fibrinogen then will be activated to form fibrin. Then fibrin will become the polymer and then they will form this mesh to make, to seal this clot. Uh, so then this will, uh, the activation of fibrinogen to fibrin. So this is what we are going to learn right now. So basically that's, this, as, as I mentioned before, this process, fibrin, fibrin is activated through a series. There are about 12 different fac factors involved in it. One factor, if it failed, then we cannot form a good clot. A lot of these factors are released from the kidney, from the liver, sorry, liver. And uh, earlier we talked about the vitamin K is an important mediator to form these clot factors. So if you learned this before, you probably know that this is a complicated process. And here in this lecture, we just make it very simple. This is the simplest version I can think about to describe these fibrinogen activation. So you can see the very bottom part here is the fibrinogen activate to form fibrin. And what you really need to know is that what, what mediated, what, what caused that activation? The thing that caused the activation is called thrombin. So thrombin can activate fibrinogen to fibrin. So that's one thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is that thrombin is the active form of prothrombin. This one is easy. So this one is pro to form the prothrombin to form thrombin. And uh, that process is activated by another protein called prothrombinase. Prothrombin. So it's prothrombin to activate it. So that will activate prothrombin to thrombin. And then thrombin become activated, will activate fibrinogen to form fibrin. That's all you need to know. This one is all you need to know. They are very complicated out there. You don't need to memorize those, but this process, this is only the very last portion is what you need to know. Uh, fibrin is the one to form the clot. Fibrin is activated, is the active form of fibrinogen. Who activate it? Thrombin. Thrombin is the active form of prothrombin. Who activate prothrombin? Prothrombinase. So that's it. And here is very, here is the only simple saying that activate clotting factors, keys factors. Actually, there are about 12 different factors out there and the whole through process will lead to this end. You only need to memorize this. Prothrombin, prothrombinase, activate prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin, activate 
fibrinogen to fibrin. So this one summarized here, fibrin is the active form of fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is activated by thrombin. Thrombin is the active form, active form of prothrombin. Prothrombin is activated by prothrombinase complex. Okay, that, that's fact, activated by a series of coagulation factors or clot factors in the blood. So that's the clot formation. Now we have the beautiful clot right here. We have this beautiful clot right here, here, here. This one is a beautiful clot. So we have the platelets, fibrin, fibrin provide this fibrin mesh to hold everything together and prevent the bleeding. Now, when this got healed, we have to remove this clot. We need to remove this clot. The way to remove it is this process right here. Clot resolution. So this is triggered by a factor called uh, plasminogen activator. A typical one is tissue plasminogen activator or short for TPA. This will resolve the free brain to break it apart and uh, to resolve it here. So TPA will activate a plasminogen activator to activate it to become plasmin, then plasmin can break apart fibrin to form the fibrin degradation products. And then it will resolve this fibrin mesh and everything will back, get back to normal. So that is that. One thing about this is that sometimes we have this clot circulated in the blood. It's not fully resolved, circulated in the blood. And sometimes that when the blood is to is staying to steal or has some damage, this blood will form this thrombosis. And this thrombosis floating around when flow into the organ, say in the brain, it will stop the blood vessel, then it will cause stroke. When the patient has this stroke, the blood vessel is blood, blocked. The patient will start to lose the function of certain portion of the brain. And it will be part of the brain will be collapsed, for example, or the movement will be affected. When the patient has that, what we do is we quickly send the patient to the hospital. And by examination, if the time is right, we can provide this drug, TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. Then it will resolve this thrombosis in the brain, in the, in the, in the vessel. And to let the blood flow to flow again and to rescue this uh, injured tissue. I start. The very last portion is the blood type. It's a long talk, man. If it's in the classroom, I probably won't talk too much. But now I'm sitting here. I have to, I, 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 I talked like too much stuff. All right, so the very last portion is the blood type. Blood type. Uh, we want to, what we need to know is that, first of all, we already kind of have some idea that we have blood type A, B, O, A, B, you know, and uh, RH factor, positive or negative. Just to give you an idea that the majority of the patient, of the people, has the RH positive. And uh, RH negative is only very few people. Now, what is blood type? 
blood type is the red blood cells. So here we have these red blood cells. Red blood cells contains on the cell surface. Why is this color? Red blood cell on the cell surface. Okay, on the cell surface, it has. I don't know why. It has the antigen. So these antigen are basically those uh, glycoprotein, glycolipids. They form this antigen. This is antigen. Antigen. This is RBC. This antigen has two types. One is type A or type B. RBC. If the person has the red blood cells with the antigen type A, this person is blood type A. If the person has type B on it, antigen type B on it is blood type B. If the person has both type A and B, so this is AB, it will have antigen A and Antigen B on it, it will be type AB. If this is red blood cell has nothing on it, this is type O. So the blood type is the de depends on the antigen in on the red blood cells. RH is also so here is if the the blood is if the blood vessel has the RH on it is RH positive. It doesn't, it's not. So this RH positive or RH negative. So that's how we define the blood type. So that's what we saying before right here. Blood type is defined based on the antigen on the red blood cells. So here is the red blood cells. If it has antigen A, it is called type A. If it has antigen B, it's called type B. If it has antigen A and B, it's called type AB. If it has nothing on it, if it not nothing, it, if it doesn't have A and B, it's called type O. So that's the red blood cells. One thing we also need to know is that in the plasma, in the fluid, it contains antibody. So for the type A person, it will contain antibody B. This antibody B can interact with B antigen. So you cannot let these two to see each other, otherwise they will interact. But in the in one person who has type A, he or she also has type B antibody. These two are not interact together, so the blood is okay. For the type B person, he has type B antigen. In the plasma, in the fluid, it contains type A antibody. So you cannot this blood to see a type a red blood cells, otherwise they will interact. But in the person who doesn't have type A antigen, they are okay, they stay together. For the person who has type A and who is type A and B, has type A and B antigen, has no antibody. For the type O person, it contains antibody A and B, there's no antigen on it. The antibody and B. 
So that's that. So very easy that type A person has type A antigen, type B antibody, type B person have type B antigen, type B antibody, type AB has type AB antigen, no antibody, type O has no antigen, antibody A and B. Now, about blood donation. When we donate blood, means that the person receive it has low red blood cells. It's not, they don't, they don't need you to donate fluid. They need, they need you to donate your red blood cells. So when you donate your red blood cells, when you are the type O person, your cells has no antigen. So this go into either one of these cells, they will not interact with your red blood cells. So you are the universal donor. You donate it, everybody can use it because there are no reaction to it. But if you are a type AB person, you contain type A and the type B antigen. You donate it to O, it will interact with it. To A, you will interact with. To B, it will interact with. So you cannot donate it to R type. However, you can receive because you have no antibody. So other people donate their blood. You don't have antibody, so you don't have reaction to R type. So you are the universal receiver. You can receive all type of the red blood cells. So that's the uh, blood uh, donation. The very last one is called the RH factor. So RH factor is also the antigen. The RH factor is called the antigen. So these cells contains the antigen on it. And uh, it's either yes or no, no D antigen on it. Um, if it does have the D antigen on it, it's called RH positive. That's what it is. Positive, this one is RH negative. The blood, with the RH positive, do not have the antibody, same as the RH negative, no antibody. So it's not like a type AB and O, which has the opposite antibody. The RH blood do not have antibody at all. Only when the person that's RH negative, like this one here, if this RH negative person got donation from the RH positive in it, then there will be reaction. It, there will be no reaction because there is no antibody. But after that, the body will start to develop antibody against RH. They will start to, so that's, that's called the RH uh, sensitized blood that will establish the antibody after the first encountering of the RH positive blood. So that's the very last one. So when the antibody interact, when the antibody interact with the antigen, they will have the interaction. One of the interaction is to, because here the antibody has two end, so you can attach on one red blood cells and the other red blood cells, so they can group and the red blood cells together. And uh, this process is called agglutin agglutination. Agglutination. Uh, in the lab, that's how we use to detect the blood type. We will prepare the antiserum. 
this anti-serum contains antibody only. So this fluid contains antibody only. It contains antibody A, antibody B, antibody AB. So that's right here. Maybe A, maybe B, AB. Here's RH. And uh, so if it, if we put antibody A with the blood and we see agglutination, then we know that its blood contain antigen A, this will be type A. If it interact with type B, we see agglutination, means that this blood, this red blood cells has the antigen B. If it interact with both, it will contain antigen A and B, it will type it will be type A and B. If it doesn't have any interaction, means this red blood cell is so smooth, nothing on it. So this, this will be type O. And that's how we, this fluid contains antibody is called anti-serum. This is, uh, you will see it in the lab exam. Because this is the experiment you will do in the lab. That's it. Oh, we finish it. So tired. <laughs> All right. So uh, hope this helps. Let me know if you have any questions. All right. I will be working on my next talk then. Stop recording. <laughs>